Hey, thanks for checking out episode 20 of the Rostrafina Project. Today's guest is a stand-up comic and the host of Boys Gone Wild. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Horatio Gould. Ross Trevina's uh, podcast uh, take one. <laughs> there you go. I'm sure there's going to be many. There's going to be many takes of this. Uh, so what? Are you just recording this whole thing? Yeah, yeah. I've already got Amazing. it recording on my end, and then I've got it recording on the video as well. Well, I think we've probably done enough. I think that's that's a pretty much. I'd say that's enough of a podcast, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a pretty good start. Just seeing me. Fanning, fucking around my room looking for <laughs> cables. That's the whole show. Uh, <laughs> One of the most anxiety inducing podcasts you could ever see. Yeah. Uh, do you still get nervous before podcasts or not really? Um, I sometimes get a bit stressed if I'm getting a guest because I they're coming in my room and if they're a guest who's not a good good friend because I do it all in my room mm. um, then I get uh a little nervous because it's just like it's weird because it's it's just the way it works it's the best place to do it is in my room uh but it's still a bit weird when you have like a comedian you respect who like you're not friends with who's older than you and then like like your bed is like a meter away from where you're talking and like your laundry <laughs> basket you just have to move your like <laughs> pants and stuff like that i think it's just a bit intimate so I don't feel comfortable like be like making maybe riskier jokes because if I say like a I don't know like a slightly off color joke immediately the whole scenario becomes rather sordid. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like <laughs> the the pants strewn everywhere is no longer charming. It's all, it becomes quickly <laughs> recontextualized as fucking dark. Have you ever had um, one that's gone wrong because of the joke you've made? No, no, I haven't done that many with guests. I've done. I started all of the. Uh, Boys Gone Wild episodes to begin with just solo and then I've got my oldest friend uh, and someone who I did student radio with for like a good uh, three years doing it so with him obviously I don't get nervous at all because we've done it literally this we've literally probably done like a hundred hour hundreds of hours of recordings but yeah I, don't, I haven't done enough uh, things but they've all gone well so far but I'm very selective with the guests I pick because it's like, it's not even, it's just guests who I think I'd have a connection with. And I don't need to get, it's like your podcast, you have to get a guest every episode, don't you? Yeah. I, I have chosen to, yeah. Yeah, at the moment, for sure. And so that means that like, you'll be looking for it. I, I'm only looking for a guest when I feel like it. Okay. So normally, it's like, I feel like I know the person well enough. I'm in the right headspace, you know, so it, it normally goes well. Yeah, I watched episode one of yours and you seem to straight away be like really good at just talking um, as the single person dialogue. Does that, does that come from stand up or is that have you always just been good at talking or was that part of the radio show you did with your current co-host? Uh, I'd say it's a mixture of both. It's something uh, I've kind of always wanted to do for a while for sure. And um, I'd say stand up uh, does that because I think when you do an, a lot of stand up, a lot of the other iterations of comedy are a lot easier. I think because that's in many ways the hardest one to get right. Um, and then yeah, and then doing radio broadcasting, student radio, doing that stuff. And yeah, I just I also, you know, we've all got we've all got like one gift, and mine is talking directly out of my asshole. So like, <laughs> that's like you know, I, I I have always had the ability to like have an opinion on every single thing, whether it concerns me or whether I know anything about it, and to talk ad nauseum, ad tedium about it in incessantly, you know? Oh, nice. Yeah, what uh, what made you get into comedy? Um, I... It was like a thing of... Like, I always... <clears throat> I was always like... I always was thinking about what I wanted to do. I was like, there's some kids who are like, they reach 17, 18, but I was like... When I was three years old, I wanted to be a cow, but that was the only, that was the only surreal um, element. The rest were pretty, a, th a pretty through line to what I ended up being. Like when I was like five, I wanted to be an inventor. When I was eight, I wanted to be a musician. 
try to be do music or can't, have no natural rhythm so that's out the fucking window uh wanted to be a painter can't fucking paint for shit um and then I wanted to be an actor, did acting, went into playwriting, wrote some plays. And I was like, okay, plays are cool, but maybe I should go for something that's not a dying art form. Started doing filmmaking, loved filmmaking, still sort of do a bit of filmmaking. Then I was like, I prefer making funny shit. And then it was just like a constant thing of that of me just trying loads of different things to see where I wanted to do. And then stand up, I've always loved comedy. And it was just a natural progression, really. And then I did my first gig and my first gig went very well. And I was like, right, I'm doing this for, you know, I'm going to be, I'm the voice of my generation confirmed. And then the next 15 gigs went awfully. Like, just like, it was like great first gig. And I was like, this is, I've, this is history in the making. And then just awful, just woeful gigs, gig after gig of utter bilge. Okay, now where was your first one? My first gig was in Robin's Well, uh, the now the now defunct Robin's Well in Leamington Spa because I was at uni in Warwick. Um, if someone says they go to uni in Warwick, that means they've never been to Warwick because I've never I've never seen Warwick. I don't know what it looks like because it's not in Warwick. It's in Coventry. Uh, on the first when we were looking to go around, look around the university, we we drove to Warwick and then realised that it literally is like 10 miles away from Warwick. It's just they're, them trying to not say Coventry. Um, and Leamington Spa is where all the students live. And I did it with my University Comedy Society uh, in the basement of this kind of ropey old pub that, yeah, now sadly closed. And yeah, it, it just, I've been kind of sort of writing material for it for about four years because I'd been like, I'd known I wanted to vaguely do stand-up and I'd been on a Word document it was like 5,000 words of just like any idea I'd... And then I picked the best of those. Um, and yeah, it went well. Okay, you done any gigs around Brighton? I do a lot of gigs around Brighton. I love the Brighton comedy scene. I'm from Lewis. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I live in Brighton now. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Cool, so you part of the you part of the Brighton comedy scene? Uh, a little bit. Well, I'm at the beginning of open mics, I say that, but... Like obviously because of the last. You're doing year like of... the Artista and the Southern Bell and. Stuff. I haven't done Southern Bell. Uh, I've done Artista. Uh, where's Type Five? Or is that Southern Bell? I think that's the Southern. Oh, Bell. I, I think that's in the Southern Bell. The oh, the that's pub. just the pub itself. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, did you ever do? Oh, what's it called? Junkyard Dogs. Yes, yeah. I have done. Junkyard I'm worried Dogs. that you might have been at my first one that went terribly. Because I really recognised your um, opening joke when I was researching your stand-up about the, the wanker that worked. Yes, I probably did. You know <laughs> that those because those I, that might be. Oh my god, yeah, <laughs> maybe. I, I the the memory's a little bit hazy, but um, I mean, junkyard dogs. It's like that. Yeah, I've had some wild psychedelic experiences watching comedians perform there. Cause, yeah, uh, it's a real. You you really get like it's in Brighton already, and then you get the sort of alt. It's such a mix of kind of weird, new, good, bad that it's got, like quite watching a whole show of like fifteen acts can actually be like quite um can be quite emotionally distressing actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. But yeah, how's it going, man? The stand-up? Well, it was going okay yeah. until the lockdown. And I just haven't been able to do any shows since then. I think there... So how, how many gigs in are you? I mean, literally only like... Five? Oh, oh okay. Are you really... Really new. Oh, you really are. Yeah, but... You really have literally just started. Okay, yeah, sorry. it was no, five. I, I, it was I thought you were was... like 50, 60 gigs <laughs> no, in. No, it was uh, five. No, so you literally... You basically haven't even started yeah, yet. Yeah, okay. yeah. It was five, but like over the space of like a year because i just get so nervous about uh performing okay yeah oh really yeah well so i've seen 20 percent of your career on stage i've already seen that potentially because i was at yeah. one of your gigs <laughs> if, yeah nice if so yeah uh what uh do you ever get stage fright at all i used to for sure um and i don't know if it's like a setting i'm comfortable in but if it's a it's a gig with pressure on it a gig you need to do well at for sure it'd be quite 
psychotic if you didn't feel a bit of stage fright. Like if I'm doing a club gig, a paid gig, I'm trying to impress a, a promoter. Uh, it, it's, if a um, a um, older comedian I respect walks in, and then I have to go on stage, definitely get a bit nervous. But I I do like I like the feeling of having nerves and then overcoming them. Like that's one of the best parts of doing stand up is that you can do that arguably like once or twice a week can be those sort of gigs and like that feeling is kind of almost what it's all about in my opinion nice uh what's the worst you've ever bombed <laughs> Oof. uh worst i've ever bombed the worst i've ever bombed uh and this is like a really important part because like i feel fine with how i'm at comedy now and like certainly people in london have sort of th- sort of thought oh you're you're like a natural or like oh you you you, you the, from the first time I saw you you seem to be pretty comfortable on stage but they, they don't realize I spent two years at uni three years at uni just bombing my ass off and be, like utter shit like, I wasn't even that great when I arrived in London but I seemed competent because I'd just emotionally been battered down to the point of like and it really it was really important three years for me because I kept trying different things. It just wasn't. I was just. I was just genuinely shit. And like I, and, and people who had even for how experienced I was, I was like bad. Like it, I wasn't progressing as fast as I felt I should be, as anyone who's good does normally. And then so we went to Edinburgh two years in a row with my university. And on the second year, this is when I nearly quit comedy because it just wasn't working. Um, I was like. Put, I had loads of gigs. I did, was doing like five gigs a day in Edinburgh just because I was desperately trying to kind of get to the bottom of work out what my style was because I was just coming across too aggressive, too unlikable and I, my, my bits, it was just it was just confused. And then this is, I had two days when I had five gigs back to back. So that's 10 gigs in two days. And I was already feeling a bit in a weird headspace because I of some like quite painful bombs I'd had. I wasn't always bombing, but like regularly eating shit. And then in the space of 36 hours, I bombed 10 times. And like what that does to a human psyche, as part of the reason I don't have much stage fright now is because when you, you put your brain through 10 bombs in 36 hours like that sort of regularity of you know emotional pain uh means that you kind of you feel like it can't get any worse and then on the 10th gig of that so the last of this array of just bomb 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 and i was just walking on stage like i don't even fucking know what to do because i just had no confidence in myself anymore on the, the the last gig of that the very last gig of that was the worst i've ever bombed because I went on stage um, and the annoying thing, what makes it bad is that people were still doing relatively well. It was like a fairly bad crowd, but like people were going on and like getting like, they could walk away with their heads, heads held high. I went on, did my first joke. It's like an aggressive joke. I can't remember it now. And the audience looked at me after I said the punchline because they were waiting for the punchline. So it was one of those ones. You know when the audience genuinely don't even know you've told a joke yet. They still think you're in the setup. And that's when it's the most brutal is when it's like, oh, you don't even know I've told a joke yet. You're still waiting for me to start telling jokes. That was the joke. And then I tried my second joke. Absolutely nothing. Still, they could not believe. They were like, okay, when's the punchline coming? Third, fourth joke. By the end, I just put the mic down and said, what's going on, guys? And then I just, like, unleashed on the audience. I was in, like, a... Obviously, I just bombed for, like, nine gigs. I was in a weird place. I was also going through, like, relationship shit. Um, so it was just, like... And Edinburgh, which is just, like, a crushing pain in general. I just, like, had a meltdown on stage um, and left halfway through. Um, so, yeah, that was my worst bomb, but it was more the accumulation of... But then because of that, and that was the night when I was like, I think I'm going to quit. After getting over that, it made me so much better as a comedian. Yeah. Had being humbled so brutally meant that I was like, I know, I know how to bomb well now, I feel. 
because I've just like I've been in that situation so many times. <laughs> How did you bounce back from that? Uh, did you end up writing new jokes, or did the jokes you already have just start working again? Uh, well, because well, because this kept happening until I got I, I turned a corner when it was like things started picking up and like I was regularly doing well and I felt like I, I was actually finding my own stuff properly funny. But because I'd had a couple of moments like this when I was thinking I might quit. I do the same thing where I'm like, throw everything away, write everything from new. I'm a new person. Try that and it would be like too aggressively new that it wouldn't work either. Um, so it was sort of a process of like, it didn't get better immediately. It was just a process of like, um, sticking with it. Um, especially as soon as I came to London, I had like a good first gig and then I saw people see me as like, without any of the context of all the bombs I'd have. So I was like, I can start afresh. And then I, that, that was something I could build on. Um, it's like moving school. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it kind of was, you know. And I, I, was, I had some good uni gigs and I was one of the better comics at uni for sure in like, my society. But I was just like, there was a couple which was so like, I, I was still so confused on stage and I was like, um, I think yeah, and that, that, that's the problem when you start really young doing comedy when you're like 18 uh, my first gig when I was 18 it's like you're, you're trying to the whole point of comedy is trying to work out who you are on stage especially when you're starting out but when you have no idea who you are off stage it means it's kind of hard you have to do both those things simultaneously so I feel as the more I knew who I was off stage as a person it became much easier to have like a natural stage presence presence you know Oh, that's interesting. Which comedians like inspired you as a child? Um, as a child. Oh yeah, what did you uh, find funny as a child? As a child, that's a great question. I think uh, someone who I still rate a lot because as a child is very different because I have a very different set of in, um, like inspirations from being a child to being older. But I'd say as a child. Um, Will Ferrell, who I still find one of the funniest people. And though, like, I haven't, you know, some taste that might be seen as, like, l less trashy than Will Ferrell. Because Will Ferrell is seen as kind of trashy, like Adam Sandler, in that sort of bracket. But I think he's a genuine comedy acting genius. And a few people can make me laugh. Because I think the, the key to Will Ferrell's genius is he's got tiny eyes. And they're close together. He's got this big, <laughs> hammy face with like a sort of the sort of jufro going on and then he's got these tiny shrimp eyes that are like close together so that he's got that sort of gift from the comedy gods which is like when he looks at the camera it's just hilarious so i'd say will ferrell probably um there's i can't think of any there certainly was a child i didn't watch much stand up the first stand-up was Live and Laughing, Michael McIntyre, but that was for like a lot of our generation. Um, but yeah, I, I can't think of kind of past that as like American comedy films, I guess. Um, the, I mean, the, probably Ricky Gervais, UK Office, the extras, stuff like that was when I was younger. But it wasn't until I was older that I started finding who I really liked, really. Yeah, that's true. Um how old were you watching Mac and Michael McIntyre and what year did that come up? That must have, I must have been like eight years old, maybe nine. That was probably my first special I ever saw. And though I'm not a fan of Michael McIntyre's stuff, now it doesn't really do it for me. There's still something to be said for his kind of broad appeal ability to like make basically kids laugh and adults and kind of the inoffensiveness of it. You know, he does something different to me completely uh, but I still I do respect that there is you can't sell out arenas worldwide without having an immense amount of talent yeah no I agree yeah uh, who contrast that with who you find funny now well yeah it's a very different thing I bet yeah um, now my kind of heroes uh, Stuart Lee uh, it's a bit of a it's become a bit of a cliche but I still think writing wise I don't know anyone who's better um, Stuart Lee I like Dylan Moran I like uh, Bill Burr I like Chappelle these kind of the big names um, I like I've been recently getting to Nate Bargatze 
who's this great comic american comic who like works completely clean but you wouldn't realize which is like a skill that i'm jealous of because i seem to always bring up my asshole or my penis <laughs> um so his ability to like talk about really funny things without at all mentioning um you know hardcore fucking or like shit you know is a real something that i admire um <laughs> Um, I like Kitson, Daniel Kitson a lot. I love the the kind of people who are like less known. I love Sean Morley. I don't um, know. Sean the last Morley. Three people I haven't recognised the name of. Well, Sean Morley, he's like he's still sort of on the circuit. Basically, he's he's like this really alt comic, comic who does hours in Edinburgh. Has a great podcast. Um, and if if anyone's listened to this, uh, check out his five minutes. Sean Morley, BBC New Comedy awards like 2014 i think it's one of the best five minutes of stand up in my opinion really weird uh comedy but i really like it sean morley sean mclaughlin he's a he's a from around brighton as well uh alfie brown of the kind of new load of comics um sarah silverman love her uh what about you how what kind of hero people inspired you uh like uh, Norm Macdonald, mm. Patrice O'Neill. Yeah, um, yeah, both of those. Yeah. yeah, they're the two main two. I really like Theo Vaughn at the moment. Uh, mm-hmm. Who English was? Uh, Paul Chowdhury. I'm finding very funny. He's very funny. Yeah, for sure. yeah. Uh, no, those are two great uh, shouts. Norm Macdonald is. There's no, He's got one of the best podcast shows ever. Um, so weird. And then Patrice <laughs> yeah. is like, I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot, a whole generation of comics, especially British comics, can learn from Patrice O'Neill, mm. as in what a stand-up comedian is and what the role is. I think sometimes in British comedy, it can, can get a bit confused sometimes. Uh, and he had a very clear idea of his role as a comedian, do you know? Yeah, definitely. Did you used to do like comedy sketches? What were your... I think you've already talked about your early projects, sort of, but... Um, what kind of sketch comedy did you used to do yeah I, um yeah because when i was like 13 14 i wanted to be a filmmaker and i made little films with andrew who's my co-host on boys gone wild um and so we just kind of like i had got a camera for christmas and we just made loads of little short films some like and these kind of weird long sketches that would not at all work now because they're like four minutes. Like, <laughs> if anyone watches a sketch for four minutes, it's like mentally ill. Um, so, but now we've, me and Andrew have started like, let go of spending like six months editing a sketch that no one will watch. And now we just film them in a day on our phone and it will get more views than anything we'd ever done before. And... Which is probably is actually I like, it's annoying because there's less technical craft, which I like enjoy about making sketches and stuff. But it's kind of also quite nice how easy it is to make sketches and how you know the the less work you put into them, the better they seem to do. Which is this weird in first <laughs> logic. Like people don't like if people think you've worked hard on a sketch, it immediately becomes less funny. Like the stuff th- that goes viral is like a, like a a fat woman in Atlanta falling out a trolley. Like that's that seven seconds will uh, be seen by more people than anything I'll ever make. So you're kind of, that's who you're competing with, <laughs> you know, in comedy, that's who you're, you're competing with fat people falling out of bins and stuff. Like that's, it's a tough, it's a tough racket. Uh, that's always been the case though, I think. But uh, so that's the way technology. But do you think it's so always been, it? I guess it's, sort of, well, back in like, you know, back in the vaudeville days, like Victorian, uh, music hall comedy do you think they were competing with well they probably were to be honest I mean there's probably that was probably the act on before you know that's why no one's gone into the theatre because it's true outside. yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm, for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah where was I going with that oh yeah so you do you do TikTok is that where you stick your sketches yeah um i was setting up tiktok for another comedian like an older comedian who didn't know social media that well um russell hicks very funny you should check him out and then i was like to test it out before i posted anything on his tiktok i was like i might as well just tip a post 
a clip on mine just to see what it would be like. And I post this 30 second clip of me doing this routine about sharks. And within a day, more people had do, seen me do stand up on that one TikTok than had seen me do stand up in four years of t- performing live. Like collectively, if I put together every single audience who'd seen me from like at least 300 gigs, it it was it wouldn't even come close to how many people saw that TikTok in like two days. And I was like, oh my God. So then I posted all of my stand up. I could, anything half decent, I've put on TikTok and really like, really scraped the barrel on some of them. Um, and now because it's locked down, I've run out. Like I did, I did a stand up post every, I did a stand up post every day. And that's how I built a TikTok following. But that lasted for about two weeks because immediately you're like, okay, no, I've literally run out. There's nothing left. <laughs> How do the different social media platforms uh, differ in regards to like fan base? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I'm not huge on any social media, really. I've got 50,000 on TikTok, which is decent for not someone right. who yeah. <laughs> is not on TikTok viewing it. But once you're on TikTok and you're seeing what's doing well, 15,000 doesn't seem that much, you know. Uh, like I remember getting like my first viral stand-up clip and I was like, this is sick. And then I saw like, I saw like a, a girl doing like putting eyeshadow on to like a Pitbull song getting three times as many views. And I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's not really, it's not really that impressive going viral on TikTok. Um, but the Facebook is just everyone like all your friends but it's like now just a destitute place for old people uh and like but yeah like it's a boomer place now facebook's kind of weird with any following you get from there um instagram is sort of i think it's now like sort of the base for most people um and that has the 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 best array of people who like you know shouldn't be locked indoors um and then TikTok, it's a real mess, but there's a lot younger, obviously. So you have like, yeah, you have, it's been funny because a lot of the people who listen to the podcast have come from TikTok. So, you know, you'll have like, these, like the, one of my biggest listeners will be called something like Darth Maul's penis or something. And like, they're all, all this generation, whereas millennials were like very proudly put their name and picture. If I feel like Zoomers are now, it's kind of moved past that where, their pi- picture will be like a picture of Seinfeld in <laughs> Technicolor and their name will be some ridiculous thing. Like, you know. Uh, that's hilarious. So which which social media do you get the most abuse on? Uh, well, it would be TikTok because I get the most comments on Is it. I just... get the most views on it. So just by just basic maths, it have to be TikTok. And also the TikTok is so um, impersonal. Like everyone who views my stuff on Instagram pretty much is following, you know, must vaguely like me. Um, but on TikTok, because it, the whole, what makes it a great app is they just shoot it out to everyone. Um, so you just get, you get people who are, who never understand what you're doing. And I really like it. I welcome hate. Um, Cause hate's a good sign, by the way. I, if I was putting any advice um, I think Nigel Ung once told me that um, uh, that when you start getting hate, it means that your stuff has left your like personal circle. So it's it's often a good sign. If you're getting hate, it means that you're like being seen by people who shouldn't be seeing you, which is good. It's what you want. Say, so, hey, you think it's TikTok because of the amount of people there are on it? Is that is there? S- Amount of strangers as well. Like yeah. everyone who sees me on the other apps knows me pretty much. Oh, okay. So there are well, YouTube, there is... I get some hate for sure. I mean, YouTube. I'm not sure if you saw. Um, I posted about it on my Instagram stories. You see, I posted. Do you know that I did this sketch about uh, the va- the side effects of the vaccines? I don't think I saw vaccine. that one. No. Yeah, so it's just a really, really stupid sketch, but we try to make it as realistic as possible because we thought it'd be oh, funny. Oh, I did actually. Like yeah, a, yeah. Like a BBC and, News bulletin. And he's talking really about, high. Yeah, yeah. I did yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it was like super dumb. Uh, we we set the whole thing up like it was really serious, and then the side effect of the vaccine was that Andrew speaks like "Hello," I, I don't, <laughs> like really, like saying it back now. It really is uh, incredibly puerile considering the amount of people dying. Uh, but 
someone commented on that and thought it was real. Oh. And then I and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" And so I, I carried on the joke, expect thought thinking he was joking. And then he was like, "I'm not going to take the vaccine, and I hope his voice gets better." It's like that. That's what you get on YouTube. Some fucking. And that, so that's really fun. You gotta imagine that's yeah, is, a really yeah. young person because even like the quality of the, you can tell when it's like uh, just shot on a phone versus when it's yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the actual uh, absolutely film. mental. <laughs> yeah, but I love mental people on the internet. It's kind of you know, it's a, I'm part of a generation where we grew up with the internet, so it's like it's less scary for us seeing mentalists on the internet. That's sort of like where I feel most at home, you know, with these fucking absolutely terrifyingly you know it's just a, a joy to know they exist you know are you in your early 20s yes i'm yeah. 23 i was a bit of an age like, gap between us so i was just wondering what uh it was like to grow up with social media at school or at mm. college well it, it seems like everyone's grown up with social media in different forms like i remember when i first was like 11 it was like msn and you know mm. if you were if you're 10 years older than me you'd be like 20 and on MSN, you know what I mean? So it's like everyone has these, it, 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 everyone has such a unique relationship with social media because it changes so much. And like even f- five years below me, the way that people use Snapchat, like my general, my, like I just about missed Snapchat. We didn't really use it. And then the kind of five years below us, they're all on Snapchat. So it moves so rapidly. Um, but when I was coming up, it was, facebook instagram um basically and twitter was still a bit too old for us i think like m- not that many people from my age group were like big on twitter no uh, uh in regards to like social relationships at school as well that uh, was there anything like did you get any trouble with sort of i don't even know if bullying's the word but when someone's fucking with you and then the fucking with you comes home as well yeah, I mean, I got, um, I once had this quite interesting case where, um, it was quite funny actually, where I posted on this kid's wall called Elliot. I said, Ellie, was it smell plus Elliot equals smellier. Because <laughs> I was trying to think of like the dumbest joke I possibly could. I don't really know why I did it. But I just thought it was so absurd to just post out of nowhere on this kid I barely knew's wall. Mm. Well, I did sort of know he was my friend's sister. Brother, brother. Um, and then, like, my mum got a call from his mum explaining how, like, horrendously I'd cyberbullied him. And then I had to go into, like, the headmaster's office. And the problem was, is, like, obviously the headmaster could see that it wasn't, like, that deep, even though I'd really hurt him, his feelings, <laughs> for calling him smellier. Um, cause like, even when he was bringing up the <laughs> message, he couldn't help himself from laughing. Cause he was like, so did you write, was it you who wrote on his wall? Elliot plus smelly equals smelly it. And I was like, yes, sir. And he was like, he, he and he could see that the other Elliot was like almost in tears. And he was like, he could see the ridiculousness of it. But the problem was, I didn't really know why I did it. Mm. So that was the main thing. And like the headmaster, like I remember that there's the only time I've seen the headmaster do this. He just went. It's a bit weird though, isn't it? And like, it was, yeah, that's a fair thing, but teachers don't normally call kids weird. Um, I still don't remember why I did it. But that's like, I don't think there's much cyber bullying on my part, uh, but it's fuck. yeah, it's real. It's real. It's tough. Um, but you know, it's, it kind of balance, it balances them. out. Like kids aren't getting, back in the 70s, kids were getting kicked to shit outside and thrown in a rubbish bin. That stuff doesn't happen as much. So, oh, you that's know, a good point. We, so maybe the cyberbullying has overtaken the physical bullying. Yeah, because like, ba- think about schools like when our parents grew up. Like, that, th- you know, let alone the open racism. You know, you know, racism online is awful. All racism is bad. But imagine like b- f- f- being in a time where you can literally just shout it in someone's face and no- nothing happens. So like, <laughs> it is cyberbullying is a real issue. But I, is it worse than the physical torment that went around? I mean, back in like our grandparents' day, uh, the, the teachers would fucking physically abuse you. Like, I hope people stop being such cucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could get whipped or like. It was yeah, a slipper, a slipper, a slipper on the ass. 
I'll take a slip on the ass as over a hate comment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's so funny. Uh, back to the story where you said about your calling the person that thing as well. I wonder how much offence is caused online by the fact you can't actually tell the way yeah. someone's saying something to you. Yeah, yeah. Which actually affects it. It's true. Yeah. What was your first joke you ever wrote? First joke. So the first joke I ever wrote is different because I didn't perform this one. Um, or this is awful. It's an awful observation, but it was the first time I think I was maybe like fifteen, maybe fourteen, and I was like, it was a time when I was const- I just f- figured out how to legally stream movies and like films and stuff. So like on Put Locker, you know those shitty sites, and I was like, I can literally watch anything. This is amazing. <laughs> Um, so over one of the summers, I'd just keep watching stuff on my laptop through then. And you'd ha- I'd, it was kind of the f- first time of seeing all of these like ridiculous pop-up ads. And like, I'd been watching quite a bit of stand-up and I was kind of getting into it. And I was thinking of like what, I'd, what I could potentially do. And I saw this one ad saying, um, secrets rich people don't want you to know. And it had like a photo of like a yacht with like a, a three hot girls on it. <laughs> And then I was I wrote this bit about how um, how funny the idea was that there's like a secret to being rich and like everyone who's rich is like just terrified of it getting out. But um, no, I never did it because you know <laughs> as that is it became quickly apparent. You know, it's not much of a you're not really sticking it to anyone by saying ads on illegal stream sites are ridiculous it's like everyone <laughs> everyone fucking knows that it's not like you've pointed out it's not like someone's going to be in the audience like yeah those ads are a bit mental aren't, i've never thought about those ads are a bit silly aren't they you know that's what they're meant to be silly so you fucking click on them but that was the first idea i had that i wrote down i remember that one clearly uh what was the first one you wrote that you ended up telling first one i wrote that I ended up telling um i think uh it probably was <sighs> it's a great question um should know this yeah i think it was a joke that i kept for ages actually maybe where it was something about um I did like a, I opened with this ridiculous brag or something about how good looking I am. And then I said, look, this is tense now, isn't it? Because I'm not ugly enough that it's clearly a joke, but I'm also not good looking enough that it's clearly not a joke. So it's creating a very tense atmosphere where you don't know if I'm joking or I'm a massive cunt or something like that, I think <laughs> that was like my opener for a while, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> I really like doing that bit. I, the, the only thing is I don't, I don't use that anymore because it means you, the rest of your set's really unflexible. And like, because well, if you have a big, bold opening, it does mean that your the rest of your material has to sort of follow in that sort of energy. So, um, but it was fun to do for sure. But what made you think of that bit? <laughs> when you came up with it. Well, I I thought it was, I've always found it funny on stage because I don't like, I I think that was actually like a bit about how it's kind of interesting in British, if you're a white straight man in British comedy, sort of the, the emphasis is on self-deprecation. That's sort of uh, what the, what people would encourage you to do is like be the sort of, because you have so much status and privilege to bring yourself down to the point where people can laugh with you you sort of need to self-deprecate if you look at most white straight men stale british male stand-ups they they normally have a lot of self-deprecation about how and then i was thinking that's sort of like i found it, it i tried doing that for a while but it became a bit forced because i didn't really hate myself and it just seemed fake and I was like I don't know why I'm pretending just and so I thought you know what the the funniest thing a white straight man can do now is just own his status and be 
um, like aggressively confident because uh, I think that's actually kind of like, oh, this is different. I'm not just having another one going on like, oh, I'm a virgin. But if someone goes on and like comes in with this attitude of like, yeah, fucking deal with it, then it's like funnier, I think. What came first, the comedy or the moustache? Definitely the comedy. The comedy. The moustache is uh, a long... The, the moustache, like the comedy, is uh, a long process of trial and error in the way that I've reached comedy after a long process of trial and error from different art forms that I failed at. Um, the moustache is maybe the the end point of uh, trying to work out how facial hair would work. Because in my opinion, if you have... The facial hair represents... The more facial hair you have, the more you have to hide. You know, you see those men who have no chins and then they have a giant beard. Yeah. And then women can't even tell if they're attractive or not. Ooh, like, I've that spoken is a to women, they're like, one. it's like <laughs> you can get with a, gen- you can get with like a generic beard guy because you don't know if he's good looking or not. Because there's too much beard there that it's not clear. He's covered all of that because he's got no chin. Uh, the best looking people are people who can go completely clean shaven. Oh. Like you, my friend. Oh, thank you very you much. Because <laughs> they've got, they got nothing. It means you've, you you can completely back your what your face. I've got good cheekbones and a good chin, so I don't need any beard. But I've got a weird snub nose and just this whole area is like odd. So I need a moustache. That's, oh, that's you my feel like it's level. A yeah, so it's like it's a... Um, but I had a goatee for a long time because mm. I thought that was the issue. But the only reason I need a goatee is if I have cheekbones but no chin. And I realized, okay, you, you, let, you let everything show that that works. And this bit doesn't work, so I cover it in the moustache. And everyone who gives me shit about, you know, everyone, people get so... Some people get, like, really incensed. It's like when I wear the headband, like this Wilson headband. People just get incensed at the audacity of, like, they think you're, do- you're doing it to wind them up. Well, you sort of are, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's funny how angry people get it's like wh- who do you think you are it's like i'm just fucking what's it fucking matter like and the reason and then people who's like think the mustache or even when i had a goatee the goatee was bad it's like as soon as i take it off they're like oh my god put it back on put it back on you know because it's it's fine you know thinking oh that mustache looks silly but you haven't you, you, you why do you see me without the mustache it's like I, I'm not I'm not over the moon with the moustache to be honest, but it's I've done the best. With, that's what all you can do. That's all a responsible adult can do is do the best with what you've got, and that's me having a moustache. Does moustache ever work with a bald head? For sure, you look like the default character on RuneScape. Oh, I've never really played RuneScape. I know what it is, though. Well, Isn't you know it? the default... Well, the default character before you've got any costume on is a bald dude with, like, a goatee. And oh, that's nice. what... Whenever I see those, I think that's the default character. Um, I can picture a bald guy with a must- uh, uh, bald goatee because of, like, Stone Cold Steve Austin from wrestling. Sure. And that, that can work. That It can definitely work. Um, I mean, because you, you've gone completely hairless, pretty much. Mm. So, because I res- I respect that the, the commitment to the you you I like it's like a it's like a it's a nice how you know you actually it's actually quite vulnerable to show so much of yourself you know oh, I enjoy I've never even I'm thought en- of facial hair as sort of like a hiding mechanism before so it is a hiding mechanism yeah I don't have much to hide but you have literally nothing to hide <laughs> so it makes me imme- I immediately trust men with no facial hair or hair on their head because I'm like. They've, there's nothing they've got to hide. <laughs> it's those Viking-looking kind of baristas. It's like they've 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 killed at least four people. There's no two ways about it. Ah, uh, that's so funny. <laughs> uh, what you got coming up, show-wise or I guess gig-wise, all cancelled at the moment. But yeah, yeah, it's quite a triggering question, actually, Ross. Yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> um, nothing, mate. Nothing. You know what? Fucking nothing. I'd love to say I've got something. I've got nothing. There's no plans. There's nothing exciting coming up. I am literally doing day by day. There's absolutely fucking zilch. Anything that anything that I've worked towards has all been cancelled. Uh, yeah, absolutely fucking nothing. How about you? Yeah, no, it's scary. <laughs> yeah, no, I wish, I wish I had something up. <laughs> That's sure, all right. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I'm always out of questions. Uh, you've already said that's all right. What uh, you've already said who to check out. Like, who's your favourite person to watch stand up of like locally? Locally, well, Sean McLaughlin would be one of them. Sean Morley, Sean McLaughlin, Alfie Brown, uh, for sure. Um, I like. I mean, there's there's people who are kind of my friends, but I don't, they're not the recommendations I want to give. To be honest. <laughs> Um, you know, watch me instead. Uh, I don't, who who have I been watching? I mean, because I, I guess the suggestions would be for people listening to this. They don't want to hear Bill Burr, Chappelle, even Patrice O'Neill, because that's any comedy fan. That's like the go-to. You sort of want to have the slightly weirder option. So I would, if anyone's listening to this and is looking for some new stuff, I would check out Sean Morley. Though. As is the problem with um, American comics, check out Sam Morrell. I think he's really funny. He's got a great YouTube hour. Um, uh, and I think that's one of the main problems with UK comedy, something that I'm trying to avoid, is that like we'll have incredible geniuses of live comedy who view any sort of mainstream success as selling out or like oh, being odd. viewed by more than like a hundred people in like a basement as like, you know, we've got these people who could easily make like be big in the States. If they like posted clips online, they had anything you could find online that wasn't like on, you know, a pop-up in a porn website or like hidden in the darkest excesses of the internet. Um, it's something that does annoy me is that there's so much talent in the UK comedy stand-up scene but there's just like, it's so hard to view any of the good shit. The only stuff you can really find is like the kind of Christmas DVD comics who are great, you know, Sean Locke, Mickey Flanagan, who are like, I, I respect a lot, but they do a very, it's a very broad appeals type of comedy. And I think what British comedy scene does the best, if you want that standard sort of comedy, America does it better. But if you want the weirder shit, I think there's a lot more encouragement in the UK to do that stuff. But, you know, John Kearns, genius. Uh, Daniel Kitson, genius. Stuart Lee has a lot of stuff online, to be fair. He's a bad example because he's great and you can find his stuff online. But you can't find anything of Kitson or Kearns anywhere. Jordan Brooks, genius. You know, Lucy Pearman, incredible. All these people, it's just like you have to see them live. And it's like, no, you should have stuff online like all good American comedians. The reason we know them all is because they've got so much stuff online. They've got specials, they've got clips, they've got, you know, a podcast that they do weekly, a video podcast. It's just so easy to watch American comics. And like, they have podcasts like Joe Rogan where they're talking constantly about American comedy. Um, and that's certainly something like when I started my podcast and posting stand up clips online is I want people to be able to just find my stuff and if they like it show it to a friend or anything like that um because i just think we're so slow on, on kind of picking that up that's interesting but what, yeah uh, what was uh the inspiration for your podcast or was it literally just a response to the fact that you couldn't go outside because of the lockdown yeah it was um it was the only thing that kept me sane like lockdown's actually been all right for me personally even though like you know, it's I've 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 kind of sort of my for my day job I produce other people's podcasts, but that work's been going in and out. So the only thing that's really been keeping me sane is the podcast. And I just had this mad. I was like, I needed to do something, and it all sort of fell into place. Really, I'd kind of always been thinking of an excuse to do a solo podcast, um, and I was kind of working with loads of different names. At one point, I wanted to call it Inherent Vice, and I'd talk about. Um, like in detail like people in the media but um that was pretentious and then finally i settled on boys gone wild and then the rest just came from that name um and the whole aesthetic and stuff um yeah it was just as a way to keep myself sane and it yeah it it, it felt it meant that i was i was in, in my house with just me and my mum and it meant that because I did it five times a week, it meant that I'd had something to do and I had that sort of dopamine hit after like finishing something pretty much every day, which is what became addictive. But I don't know how I did it because I wouldn't be able to do that again. Genuinely, I don't know how I managed to get that much stuff out. It was, it was like a different person. 
That's fucking crazy. What um what has doing Boys Gone Wild taught you about males? Um, well, that's good because it's like I thought the reason why the title, even though it's now no longer really about that, uh, now it's just me and Andrew fucking around. But uh, because I just don't have the energy to do the research I did before. But before it was a genuine. It just I just felt in the media it was like the way that m- men were being portrayed, and often rightfully so for their toxicity and damage. I just felt like there is another side to masculinity that people just don't seem you know, ready to have a health discussion about, which is that they are, they, there's every man is inherently stupid, like, and inherently funny. It's a, it's a double edged thing that every man I've ever met or in history you read about, there's something inherently ridiculous about every single man. And I don't know what, and that's what's always made me laugh is that I think it comes from the pressure society puts on men to be, successful and to be kind of alpha or to be like make something of themselves and how often the the lengths that men will do to try and achieve this kind of vague goal often re- results in such hilarity um so yeah i think the reason i started boys gone wild is to really hammer home that all men are fucking dumb. Even Stephen Hawkins, even really smart men, even like the smartest men ever, they are, there's something, there's an element to them that's just like, like a big dumb golden retriever. Like we're all, all of us are just hilarious idiots in my opinion. I mean, women are dumb too and women are very funny too, but I don't know if it's like inherent, I don't think that, I don't think women are as inherently ridiculous as men. I don't think they're, they're, they're just like, Deep to their core, there is ludicrous and utterly absurd as men. <laughs> yeah, I think it might be a byproduct of testosterone to do with like for sure how uh, impulsive guys seem to be compared to ladies. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, all of those kind of things, and it's also the confidence that men have and how little it often shows up to their ability. You know, women, the most talented women, will still think they're awful because they're told constantly that, you know to be feel insecure about themselves but like the most talentless men will just believe they're the dog's bollocks and i just there's there's something fascinating about it um but how how have you been um coping with lockdown ross what what kind of genre of lockdown detainee are you you coping well you yeah i've been pulling, doing okay. pulling, i was about to say putting your hair out but that sounds salty maybe you have hairy before like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe you had a full head of hair at the beginning of lockdown i had big golden locks uh yeah i've been okay i've just been yeah the, but me too was starting the podcast because of, well not because but actually getting around to do great it was, uh perfect because of the lockdown and yeah i've just been trying to keep saying i don't think i've gone as mad as other people but then i've I'm pretty chilled, but then I'm pretty worried. But yeah. So what? What? Why did you start the podcast? Obviously, something to do. But what's the sort of founding oh. reasons as to what you wanted to uncover? Just give me something to do. It's great to talk to people as well, and uh, yeah, just talk to interesting people, basically. Yeah, and it is, uh, and is it how? What? What percentage of them are comedians? Is that the main thrust, or is it a real array? Uh, it's been an array of guests. It's usually like they they often end up being funny, but um, yeah, it's only been like a handful of comedians so far. The other two I've had on okay. is uh, do you know Riggs? Yeah, no, I listened to the Riggs episode. Oh, you and did? I decided okay. I li- I uh, when I, before I was doing it, I wanted to just check what the vibe was, and yeah, the, it was great. Uh, but it just it it it, it, it sounded like a comedian's podcast. You know, it's good. Oh, thanks, um, man. Uh, Sadia Asmats is the another one I had on. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I know Sadia. Nice yeah. Sadia, well, oh, um, nice. she's great, and I know Riggs well actually because oh, um. Good. So you, when you've done gigs, you've been vaguely in the bright because I've sort of been in the London circuit, the Midland circuit, and the Brighton circuit because my I live in London, my mum lives in. And I grew up in Sussex and I went to uni in the Midlands. And the Brighton circuit is the loveliest circuit I've been on. They're just they're just all really nice. Everyone's I just love the vibe on the Brighton circuit. It's a oh, great place good. to start. Oh, cool. Very good place to start. It might not And people like Riggs. People mm. like Riggs. Uh, you know, he 
he's a great example of a great Brighton comedian and just that whole vibe I really really liked nice all right well I gotta call it a day because I really need to piss but yeah thanks for coming on man no worries mate hey thanks for listening and thank you to Horatio for joining me follow him on social media and check out his hilarious podcast Boys Gone Wild on YouTube Spotify and Apple Podcasts follow the show on Instagram and Twitter at TRTP Pod and tell your friends to check out the Rostafina project okay bye